All right. Okay, so I got to tell you my, um, most of my, I, I got to be careful for all my camera people. Am I, am I okay in your light here? How far, how, if I come up, like, there's where my light stopped. All right. Um, sorry. I just, I just want to be close to you. Um, <laughs> So uh, my mother lives in Indiana, my sister lives in Indiana, my brother's a slumlord in Indiana, and um, <laughs> you ought to go investigate him, that'd be fun. Um, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, this is becoming my family home, even though uh, nobody ever grew up here, they all just kind of moved here, but, um, so I feel like I'm close to my family here. Um, what do you need to know about, what do you want to, you're a journalist, ask me some questions. What do you need to know about where I'm coming from, what I do, my, my point of view? What do you want to know? Maybe what's the most valuable knowledge you can have as a journalist. Oh, so what do you need to know in order to, yeah. okay, all right, so that's what we're going to do. Yeah. This session is all about, <laughs> we're going to go right to the bottom line. Okay, how do I get a job? <laughs> right? Yeah, how do I get a job? How do I, what do I have to know? And I'm going to turn the question just a little bit. It's not just what do you have to know to be a journalist, but what do you have to know to really land a job? Well, if you, knew, if you just knew some stuff, it would make you very different from the rest of the job pool. And that's the key, isn't it? I mean, the key is you've got to be different from everybody else in some kind of way. So I'm going to try to give you some very specific answers. And for those of you who especially will be with me in other sessions, I would just want you to get used to a couple of things. One. I love to have interaction, so please ask questions, push back, disagree, argue, whatever you want to do, that's fine. We're all journalists and that's what, that's what we do, right? We push, 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 ask lots of questions. So please be, uh, be free in your, um, in your interactions. Everybody okay with that? Remember I said be free with your interactions. Everybody okay with that? Okay, just relax. Everybody just relax. You're so uptight. Um, <laughs> All right, so that's what we're going to do. So, what students need to know in order to get hired? Now, I would say the more, uh, the more of these things you can do, the more marketable you're going to be, all right? Um, it used to be that you had to have certain core skills. When I say used to be, I mean like, you know, a few years ago, um, when you were in high school, or maybe just a little before that. But this is what it looked like not very long ago. Not very long ago, it looked like if you could write, if you knew something about ethical decision making, critical thinking skills, which I'm going to say a lot more about uh, in another session, you had to know audio. Even if you were in print, you kind of had to know audio because we expected for you to do some audio stuff for the website, you know, some podcasts or whatever. Uh, editorial judgment, of course. Still photos and social studies. And social studies, by the way, I don't, uh, it kind of sounds silly, but the fact of the matter is, is you've got to know how stuff works. And I find an astonishing number of journalists don't know how stuff works. Um, and so that's the reason why they don't get hired is because they don't understand. But this is what you gotta know now. All of it, uh, it's not, you don't just go to the right screen, you, not, you get the whole screen. Your job is a lot more difficult now than it was when I graduated college, that's for sure. What you're gonna walk into is a world that expects more of you than they certainly ever expected of me when I graduated college. Um, so I would say that if you're going to graduate and go into any part of journalism, probably any part of PR, um, almost any kind of communication, these would be the minimum skills. So add to that first list video, video editing, that doesn't scare you, does it? I mean, you grew up at a time of video and video editing, right? Shoot video with your phones, you can edit on iMovie or whatever. That doesn't bother you. It just doesn't, it scares your professors, but it doesn't scare you, right? It's just like, yeah, it's video. Social media, of course, but um, I'm not just gonna talk about, oh yes, I can Facebook or I can, I can tweet or Tumblr or Pinterest or anything else. I mean, I really mean a sophisticated use, a sophisticated, a sophisticated understanding of how to use social media to reach very targeted audiences. Mapping and data analysis. Mapping is an increasingly important tool. And while I don't think in this stay with you in the next day and a half, um, 
I'm going to spend much time talking about data mapping. Let me just encourage you to spend some energy on this. One place that I would go if I was you is a site called the Sunlight Foundation's website, Sunlight Foundation. I think it's sunlightfoundation.org or sunlight.org. Um, the Sunlight Foundation is a nonprofit institute in Washington, D.C. that specializes in teaching journalists how to use data mapping. And they have a whole suite of tools. They're all free. And they're incredibly useful and not that hard to use. So you just import Excel spreadsheets or uh, some sort of data. It could be from online or something you generate. And it instantly creates maps, interactive maps. It's incredible. Um, and you don't have to know any coding or anything. And they're all embeddable. It's really cool. So I strongly urge you to think about that. Slideshows are still pretty popular, although the way that we're using slideshows, uh, still slideshows now, um, is a little different than it used to be. It used to be that we would put them in a rotator, you know, that would slide horizontally. And now mostly slideshows are vertical uh, because of the metrics that people want to use now. Instead of page views, mostly we're moving toward time spent on site. It's a different audience engagement now that the advertisers want. So advertisers are less and less interesting in page views or unique users, and they're a lot more interested these days in time spent on site. And so that's changed the way that we're laying out pages from a horizontal scroll to a vertical um, scroll. So, um, and then social engagement. Social engagement obviously comes in a lot of different ways. It's just not the comment box at the bottom of your column, but actually engaging people in different social media. So we'll talk about some of these things as we go along. Anybody want to quit? Too much for you? I don't feel like doing all this. I just want to shoot pictures. I do. It makes me tired looking at that list. <laughs> all right, so what skills do we actually need? Okay, so I, I gave you the core things that, I gave you the core things you're going to have to know. Those are just mostly tools, right? Those are just tools, but what awarenesses do we have to have? Well, part of it is critical thinking. Getting beyond the what to the so what, or the why, or the how, or the how do we know that? Who else knows that? What if it's not true? What motivation do they have for saying that? A different way of looking at information. Not just what did they say, but why did they say it? It's a very different set of questions. It is my experience that young people have much sharper critical thinking skills than my generation and the generation before me. What proof do I have of that? In 1962, when Gilligan's Island went on, there were uh, over 100 people called the Coast Guard to find out why they didn't go rescue those people. Wow. You know, I mean, it's like, really? <laughs> um, news judgment. What is news? Now, I find this is your challenge. I, I, if you have kryptonite, this is it. Um, I find that young people are struggling right now to figure out what is actually newsworthy, what's actually important. And I think it's not your fault. I think you've grown up in an environment where so much stuff comes out the fire hose that kind of looks like news that you never really grew up in the discerning period that um, people of my generation and before had more people sort of filtering news and it looked like news, but it looked like news to us. So I think the whole idea of what's truly important is a more difficult question for you. Um, I hear professors say this all the time, and I don't know if it's true, I'd love to know what you think of it, but I hear professors say all the time, these young people, they're talking about you, these young people don't care about news. Do they ever say this to your face? They say it to me all the time. Do they say this to you? Is it true? You remember that part where we were going to talk back to each other? You remember that? <laughs> so tell me, is it true? I mean, are they right? Is it that you don't care about news? No. Well, what are they missing? Because you don't seem to care about news to them. You're not reading a newspaper, and you're not watching the evening news. So what evidence is there that you care about news? Somebody tell me, what are we missing here? Our news is different. Different how? Yes, but that's not news. That's coffee shop rumor, isn't it? Do you care about Syria? Yeah. Yeah. Do you care about, um, do you care about the, um, the typhoon? You do. Um, do you care about the, Ob the struggle over Obamacare? What happened on Obamacare today? Well, there weren't very many people who signed up on 
<laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> I could have signed up more people than that if they just called my house, you know? You know what I said? You know what, you know what I think they ought to do? I think they ought to let QVC or Home Shopping run Obamacare. Because they, they can sell like 36,000 toasters an hour, you know? Why don't they just do that? I mean, they'd be great at that. Anyway, I occasionally run off course. I'm sorry. Um, so, yes, he basically said, Okay, look, all you people who got dropped by your insurance company, your insurance company's gonna have to give you your insurance or offer your insurance. It's like, really? We're, we're going back to that now? Um, so yeah, it's a colossal development. And you know about that because you actually care about news, right? Right. Um, but you get your news differently. You're not just watching CBS Evening News, right? Who do you watch for news? Who do you read for news? What's your news source? Apps. Who? Apps. Apps. What kind of apps? Just like the news apps or pop up. But what news apps? Local stations. Local stations. You watch Indianapolis television stations? Okay. So you're watching the Indianapolis television stations. What else? Huffington Post. Huffington Post. Okay. What else? What are your other major news sources? Fox News, that's, that's interesting. I don't often get that on college campuses, um, but I sort of expect to get that from a Wesleyan school. Uh, you're, a little, you know, you're a little more tied down than I, than I usually get. Um, so why do you watch Fox? Why do you watch Fox? Who said Fox? You. I, yeah. I, it's just what my parents watch, so I just stuck with it. It's so what your parents watch? Yeah. yeah. Um, are they Republican? Yes. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Fox as a news source? Um, overall, I think it's, it's good. I don't think it's always fair and balanced like they say. You don't think it's always fair and balanced? I'm repeating in case they can't hear. Um, so you don't think it's always fair and balanced, but you'd say that probably about any news source, wouldn't you? I mean, they're not always, yeah. yeah. Um, but you think overall they're a reliable source of news? Yes. Yeah. Um, what else do you watch? John Stewart? Yeah? <laughs> the, the old guys in the back back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, John Stewart, who else do you watch for news? Do you call that news? John Stewart, do you call the Daily Show, John, you call that news? Yeah. There's sometimes a little news in there, right? Sometimes. At least, the thing I know about, about the Daily Show is if you don't watch the news, you don't get half his jokes. Um, ESPN, anybody get their news from ESPN? I get that from a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people tell me that's a principal source of news for them. Boy, they cover Syria great, don't they? ESPN. Um, what else? Who else is your news source? You guys over here. Where do you get your news? Associated Press. So, or do you get on the Associated Press? What do you have an app or something? Yeah. Or, yeah. So you, so you're depending on on push technology. You're depending on them to tell you when it's news. And if you get a bulletin from AP. Um, how often do you actually drill in on that to, to read more than a sentence? I think sometimes if it seems uh, more interesting to know. Okay. If they do send... Would you say once a day? Um, probably not once a day. But not even once maybe, a day? Maybe a couple of times. So the, most of your news consists of a few sentences of news. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why your professors are worried about you. To them, that doesn't seem like you care about news. What would it take to get you to do more of that? To read more stuff, to read a 500 word or a 1,000 word story, what would it take to get you to do that? Something groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. <laughs> I was hoping for merely interesting. It's got to be groundbreaking. <laughs> All right. Um, I would say that the best chances we have is if it has to do with money, family, safety, health, and community. Money, family, safety, health, community. Um, that would be a good thing, right? But, but most of the news stories that you are interested in, that you're going to, are not one of those things. They're merely interesting, what I call innate curiosity. And that's the problem. The problem is, is, that, is that we've got to find a way to get you more engaged in something that's not just merely interesting, but is truly important. That's my worry with celebrity news. Um, celebrity news is interesting but it's rarely important. And so we've got to find a way to make real news as engaging as celebrity news. So 
if you're going to be successful in journalism, this whole idea about being curious about the world around you is just vitally important. When I was in college, and I'll try not to say that phrase very often when I'm here, but um, since I'm talking to you about how to get a job, when I was in college, one of the things that I found to be the single most valuable pieces of education I ever got, more valuable probably than anything I got out of a classroom, is I was a reporter working for a radio station, later a TV station while I was a student, but I would go to the city council meetings, every, every city council meeting, and there would always be a training session type thing that would occur right before the city council meeting where the new commissioners would get trained by the city manager how stuff worked. And I learned about sewer systems, I learned about taxation and annexation, and I learned about all the, all the ways that cities work, landfills. I learned about all the way that cities work, and I gotta tell you, I, I never would have gotten that any other place. Um, and it was fascinating to me. I know a lot about sewers now. Um, learn new skills. You're never going, I tell educators this all the time, don't spend all of your energy teaching these people how to edit on video, uh, you know, edit video. I would not do a class on video. I would not. Why? Because you can learn it. You'll learn it. You'll come in on a weekend, you'll learn how to edit, and you're done. Or you'll watch a YouTube tutorial and you're done, right? It doesn't scare you. It doesn't scare you. And you have to have a passion for journalism. If I meet a student and I say, what are you interested in? And they go, I don't know. And I say something about journalism and it doesn't get their hackles up. When I say journalism dead, television's dying, if somebody doesn't jump up and fight me, then I know they probably don't have a passion for journalism. Guy sent me a book yesterday. Some guy I'd never heard of. He wrote some book about journalism is dead, television's dead. I felt my anger coming up, like, what do you mean? Like your baby's ugly, you know? Um, <laughs> um, so what I would say to you is, is you have to have a passion for journalism if you're going to do this job. It's too hard. It pays too little. The hours are too long. If you don't have a passion for it, go do something else. But if you do have a passion for it, it is the coolest way to make a living ever. I would do it over again in a minute. I love journalism. I loved every minute of it, almost, sort of. I love many minutes of it. <laughs> All right. So let's look at this. I'm not going to pick on Fox. It's just that this happens to be the first one up. I'll actually stand over here next to you if it makes you feel better. But um, I'm not a Fox hater. It's just that they do things that are stupid sometimes. But so do other people, right? Uh, so let's take a look. So, anybody think about Nebraska lately? Imagine you're a farmer or a rancher and you look up one day and you see this plane and then a couple weeks later you get a note in the mail that says um, EPA has been flying uh, overhead on your land and you have a discharge to without permit letter. But anyway, this is what's happening. The EPA is flying uh, overhead, mm -hmm. spying basically on farmers and ranchers. They say they're doing you know, regulation and checking to make sure. But there's a bipartisan coalition led by Sec Senator Johans and uh, Congressman Adrian Smith out there just to, uh, to ask EPA, what in the world are you doing? And even, um, I think it, it, it's so bipartisan that even Bob is in solidarity wearing dark glasses. I, I have my so spy weird. glasses for, for, because they're drones, they're flying overhead, not the dr same drones. No, they're they not, do. they're taking pictures. No, 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 they're drones. Listen, here's the problem with this. The FAA has a bill, the authorization bill, that's going to allow th thousands of these things to fly over the United States. The idea that you Okay, now what now? Okay, everybody practice that phrase with me. What now? What now? now say it like your mama. What now? What now? Uh, I'm going out with my friends, and we'll be back at like 2 in the morning. What, what now? <laughs> okay, so... What did they say? <laughs> EPA is going to have drones, and the drones are going to spy on cattle ranchers in Nebraska and Iowa. Why? <laughs> what? Like a predator? Are they going to have, like, missiles and stuff? <laughs> Why would they do that? This doesn't make any sense to me. When you use the word drone, what do you think of? You think terrorism. You think death from the sky. Spying on our nation's farmers? Republican lawmakers demanding answers today.
after learning that the Environmental Protection Agency has been using aerial spy drones for years what? to spy on cattle ranchers. These are the same drones we use to track down al-Qaeda terrorists flying over Nebraska and Iowa. You wait, wait a minute, what? <laughs> First of all, why would EPA have drones? And secondly, why would they have predator drones? And what is it that these cattle farmers are doing that's so interesting? <laughs> EPA's use of drones. This story is everywhere now. I mean, it's moving and moving and moving. It's all over the place. And it starts getting picked up by what some people call the pajama hadeen. The, 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 the bloggers who love this kind of stuff EPA using spy drones. Really? Oh, no, not really. Well, a clarification now. In a report we brought you roughly two weeks ago, we were reporting on the EPA conducting aerial surveillance over ranchers and farmers in the Midwest. We identified and discussed the aircraft as being unmanned drones. In fact, the EPA is flying these missions and taking pictures from manned aircraft. We apologize for the confusion. You mean like fighter jets? <laughs> no. Um, this was, by the way, weeks after they, they repeated that other story many times. As you can see, it was across more than one newscast, plus their website. And if you go on their website, even today, has anybody here got a phone or a, something like that? Anybody, is there anybody here that's logged on to something that you can get on? Okay, somebody jump on real quick. Just uh, Google a phrase like uh, Fox News drones ranchers, and you will find that this is still up there. They still have stories on their website saying, even though that they did that heartfelt 20-second correction, they still have stories on their website saying that they're running these predator drones out there on these cattle farmers. It's not true. It's not even close to true. It's not even sort of true. What they do is the same thing they've done for decades. They have little Cessna planes, and they fly over the land to do surveys for EPA for looking for things like chemical runoff, um, for um, creek pollution, waterway pollution. Why wouldn't they just walk around? Because, have you ever been to a Nebraska farm? Do you know how big that is? You couldn't possibly do it by land. You do, huh? Uh, you couldn't possibly do it by, by land. So they fly around in these little airplanes and look for things like chemical runoff and stuff. They've done it for decades. There's nothing new about this. Predator drones, what a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> I mean, it's just outright crazy. When you first saw that first story, did it appear to you that this could be so outlandishly inaccurate, false, not even close? No. It looked real. It looked like something that could be true. And you've got to raise your antenna. If you're going to get a job in journalism, if you're going to be successful in journalism, you've got to have a red hot nonsense detector that says, oh, come on. Really? That can't be true. You got to be willing to push back. You got to be willing to push back. That's got to be part of your DNA or at least your skill set. If you're going to be a great journalist, you got to ask questions. If you're, not, if you're not comfortable doing that, if you're not comfortable challenging authority, this isn't for you. You can, you can be nice. I know lots of nice journalists. I know some that are nice, but I know a lot of nice journalists who are very successful. Anybody get online and find this? Yes, you did? It's still up, right? Yeah, of course it is. Still up. No notation on there about being false. No correction, no retraction, no nothing. They ne that, was, that was the only retraction they did. What was it, 15 seconds? Oh, boy. <laughs> this is the FBI. One Friday afternoon, I was um, packing up to go out to do a workshop someplace. And this crossed on my Twitter feed, because I'm a big Twitter follower. 
So this crosses on my Twitter feed. FBI this week, infant abductors using new and violent techniques. What now? Really? <laughs> FBI infant abductors, a violent trend emerges. OK, I sat back down. OK, I'm in. What do you got? Here is a quote from somebody who's a criminal profiler, quoted in the piece, Ashley J. Douglas. In some cases, with expectant mothers, they actually cut the infant out of the mother's womb, thus killing the mother and attempting to take the infant. <laughs> really? I've never heard of this. And it's a violent trend. It's a trend, according to your FBI. One of you who's online, Google this. There must be a gazillions of them, or they, wouldn't be, or they wouldn't be doing this, right? I mean, there must be like zillions. So while you're looking that up, infant abductor, new and violent techniques. Now, what they want you to do, this is actually, this is not a, this is not a spoof, by the way. I mean, this is actually from the FBI website. And you can Google this, it is still up there. Exactly what I'm showing you, it's still up there on the FBI website. Just put in infant abductions FBI, guarantee you'll come up with it. So I said, what are they talking about? So what they do is they have these audio things like this and they want radio stations and stuff to download this and run it. They want you to run this stuff. They want you to report on it. They released a news release on a Friday afternoon. Why would they do it on a Friday afternoon? because it'll get great play on the Sundays. It'll get great play on a Saturday newspaper. The FBI has an important message for new and expecting parents. Emerging trends show women who abduct infants are using new methods to commit their crimes. I'm Molly Halpern of the Bureau, and this is FBI This Week. The FBI is seeing an increase in infant abductions in non-hospital settings. The rise is attributed to enhanced security measures at hospitals. Intelligence analyst Ashley J. Douglas with the Criminal Investigative Division says that as a result, women abductors are using more direct and sometimes violent violent techniques. In some cases with expectant mothers, they actually cut the infant out of the mother's womb, thus killing the mother and attempting to take the infant. Abductors are now using social media to target pregnant and new mothers. The sites are an easier and less risky way for perpetrators to develop trusting relationships with their victims. We want to get the message out to these new and expectant mothers to let them know on these social networking sites. Make sure that your privacy settings are up to par. For more information, visit FBI.gov. No! We're all going to die. <laughs> How many did you find? I mean, I literally just found the one thing that the FBI had put up. Yeah. It's on their website. It's on their website, yeah. So uh, did you, but you didn't find any cases where somebody had met somebody on social media, tracked them down, cut open their womb, and stole the child? I mean, that's Not kind one. of a lot to put into Google Chrome, but uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> no, if it's a violent trend, you ought to be able to put in like infant abduction, womb cut, and yeah, get there, no, right? You didn't get anything. Yeah, you got nothing. Nope. And you're not going to. <laughs> I called the FBI. I talked to Molly, and I said, "Well, how many of these cases were there?" And she was furious. <laughs> she said, "Well, the FBI wouldn't tell you this. It wasn't true." Oh, whatever. I said. Okay, well, how many happened? Why, are you doubting me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Now that you mention it, I guess I am. <laughs> well, I said, look, I, 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 I just did a search, a search to see, because you would think that there would be a lot of reporting on this. I mean, you would think that'd be a news story, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't care where it is. That'd be a story. I don't care where it is. Well, not every story that we, not everything we track, you know, is reported in the news. I said, but if it was a trend, I'm thinking that we would hear about it. Well. <laughs> okay. Even their own website says it's relatively rare to be, for infants to be abducted by strangers. I didn't type that. I clipped that from their website. That's what their website says. 
I think it's a story that the FBI would say that and release it in a news release. I want journalism students to start seeing stuff like that and go, really? That seems like a story. Do we get a sense uh, of why they put this out? Well, why might they have put it out? I don't know why they did it. She wouldn't say. I, I, what are some possible motives? What are some possible motives for any police agency or any agency at all to say something like that? Uh, it gets attention. Huh? But I, it gets attention. It gets attention, also, but why would they want attention? I, I almost wonder if the real issue is they're trying to say what set your privacy settings on social media a certain way. Well, that's an interesting idea. My guess is is that I don't. I, the answer is I don't know. Yeah. But. I can think of a lot of motives. One might be to scare people into feeling uncertain, and certainly the FBI must be looking after me. One might be, we need some funding. One might be, not much going on this week, uh, I, and, and, and we need to get the blog out. I don't know. On the other hand, there could be a secret trend going on of people getting their wounds cut that we still don't know about. I don't know. It's very secretive. If you're going to get a job in journalism, you need basic investigative skills. And basic investigative skills to me means that you have the ability to go to mainstream government websites and figure out what they mean. So places like congress.gov, which up until a week ago I think was called thomas.gov, but Congress had to name it after themselves. Thank you. Um, Edgar, uh, th with with, with Thomas.gov, you can get the history of any piece of legislation filed in Congress back to 1898. It's an amazing website. Government doesn't screw everything up that it touches. It doesn't. I mean, there are, things, there are websites that it does that are just amazingly good. Congress.gov is one of them. Edgar.gov is the Securities and Exchange Commission website. It's spectacular. It's wonderful. It's easy to use. It's constantly updated. And, um, and it, it, it's every piece of public data that a publicly traded company has to file. A publicly traded company is any company that's on a stock exchange. So the, uh, uh, the NASDAQ, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, Amex. EPA.gov. Wonderful website, really terrific, easy to use. You can investigate water quality in any water district in the United States. You can find out every single person who has a permit to emit any kind of toxic discharge. You want some fun reading? Read the uh, U.S. Toxic Inventory, which is uh, just, it's just great. You can put in any county and see every toxic emit uh, emitter for, um, for soil, for air, or for water, or, for, or, or radiation. It'll keep you busy for weeks. Um, but I mean, you gotta love to look at stuff like this if you're gonna be a journalist. I love reading those things. Guidestar.org uh, is a website that tracks nonprofits, and you can actually read the actual nonprofit financials that are filed. It's called an I-990. Um, it's a tax form. And so any nonprofit, you would be able to see how much they take in, how much they spend, how much people make in salaries, and so on. I mean, think about that. All these uh, charities taking in stuff for, um, for the uh, uh, typhoon victims. Wouldn't it be interesting for you to investigate all, everybody who's on campus taking up money or whatever it is they're taking up for the typhoon victims, I think you ought to investigate every one of them. Every one of them. Just pull their 990s and see how much money goes to the actual charitable work. That'd be pretty fun. And it's easy to do, really easy to do. I would never do a story on a charity without pulling their 990. I saw a story the other day on somebody who um, had, they were doing, uh, it was called uh, Souls for Shoes, Shoes for Souls, or something like that. Shoes to Souls, Shoes for Souls, something like that. You ever heard of this? Were you're supposed to donate your used shoes to somebody in Haiti or something? Did you ever look to see what the story was on them? They were selling the shoes. Nobody in Haiti wants your stinky used shoes. 
it just clogs up the system. They don't want your shoes. They don't want your old medicine either. They don't want any of that stuff. It causes bigger problems. They, they can't use it. And so it, what happens is, is they sh truckload, shiploads of stuff end up in these, in, these, uh, in these disaster areas. There's nobody there to receive it. There's nobody there to sort it. They can't make any sense of it. They don't know what it is. It could be dangerous if it's outdated. It causes huge problems. The only thing these people want is money so that they can buy what they actually need for relief. They don't want your shoes. They need money so that they can buy the medical supplies that they need in order to help. That's the way disaster works. But nobody wants to hear that. I want to ship shoes. <laughs> That's a great story. Nobody wants your stinky shoes. That's a great story. You're out there, right? You're still there? Yeah. <laughs> Google Trends. Anybody use Google Trends? Love Google Trends. Google Trends is a way for you to find out what's hot before anybody else knows it's hot. Let me give you an example. During the um, government shutdown, was it three or four weeks ago, whatever it was, right? One of the things that shut down was the Centers for Disease Control flu tracker site. That's a problem because it was right in the beginning of the flu, tr flu season. Lucky for us, we have Google Trends, which includes the Google Flu Tracker. Google Flu Tracker is so important that even the CDC watches Google Flu Tracker. Why? Because it turns out that as soon as you get the flu, what's the first thing you do? You Google flu symptoms. And then a few days later when you're not well because the flu doesn't go away, you go to the doctor, the doctor goes, oh, you got the flu. The doctor has to fill out a form. He gets to the health department. The health department sends it to the CDC. CDC gets it 10 days later. So now their flu data is 10 days old. But, but Google got it as soon as you put in flu symptoms. So they started tracking what people are Googling and when you Google it. And now you can know, when do young girls start looking for prom dresses? Anybody know? When do young girls start looking for prom dresses? January, January, not April, okay? April is, oh my God, I didn't know Charlie was gonna uh, take me out. I, I guess I'll get, I'll get a prom dress, you know? So what happens is, is that you have another bump at a week or two or three before prom season, but the real serious prom goers start looking in January. And so anybody who wants to do a story on prom trends, if you wait until April, you're too late because the ones who care about such things jumped in in January. Well, why would this be important for you to know? Because you need to know when people are actually looking for something. Just because you're interested doesn't mean everybody's interested. I got into a debate one time with the sports director at a television station. He says, every, actually, I think, now that I think about it, I think it was in Indianapolis. He says, everybody uh, is turning to soccer now. I said, no, they're not. No, they're not. I'm not in Indianapolis. I said, just because your kids play soccer? No. I mean, I'm sure it's big, but it's no. So we just did a flu trend, and I just, I mean, a, a soccer trend. Um, and I compared soccer to basketball and football. It wasn't even close. Not even close. It's not even close. And so I'm not guessing about what people are interested in. I can actually demonstrate what they're interested in. And marketers are very, very tuned into this. Big companies are watching. When are people buying whatever. They're really interested right now in when will people start buying winter clothes? What's the right time to start bringing out spring fashions? Because the online world has changed our shopping habits. And this year we've got this weird Christmas season that's going to be compacted by several days between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's going to be crazy, man. It's the end of the world. <laughs> and basic Excel skills. They're going to have drones over top of you now. Basic Excel skills. Uh, I strongly recommend that you get yourself smart about using Excel and database skills. This is something that would make you instantly marketable. If you don't know how to use Excel, this would be the sort of thing that somebody as smart as you that grew up you know, with computers in your hands your whole life, this would be the sort of thing that, boy, you, you could really make yourself extraordinarily valuable in a newsroom. So I'm a spreadsheet person. If you know how to do spreadsheets, you can do pivot tables, you can do uh, sorting and, and mapping. Phew. That's like a second language, man. 
It's really great. Put that on your resume. That'd be a big deal. And you know what? You could do this no sweat. We teach people Excel skills at the Pointer Institute in about two days, about two days of workshops. We can, we can make you pretty literate. And then analyze the budget. I, I, I don't know if, if, if there's any kind of class material you're doing on budgeting, but I strongly would urge you to start looking at budgets to figure out how they work. Basically, there are two or three things that you ought to always look at on a budget. One is revenue, one is expenses, and the other is assets. And then liabilities. Liabilities often fall into expenses, but they might also be long-term liabilities. But if you know how to look at a budget and analyze those three things, assets, expenses, and income. How much are we taking in? How much is going out? What assets do we have? If you can do that, you become really valuable. And you ought to be doing this with your university budget. You ought to be doing this with your athletics budget. You ought to be doing this every place that you can think of. You ought to be looking at these budgets. You've got to get good at looking at budgets. Doesn't that sound like fun? Can't you wait to do that? I love that. Um, court systems. Find your way into a court system, not as a defendant. Find your way into a court system uh, and, and sit around and figure out how this stuff works. Court systems are fascinating, and I'm, uh, I'm, I always walk out of a court system impressed with how serious they are. But you need to understand how they work. What's an indictment? What's a warrant? What's a search warrant? What's a bill of particular? What's a bench warrant? What's the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor? What's a plea bargain? What's a probation? What's the difference between probation and parole? You gotta know all these things. You gotta know all these things, and I suspect you probably do. You've watched enough CSI and all that. Um, and that's, I gotta tell you, that's not a terrible way to start getting used to some of these words. Um, but go sit yourself in a courtroom and just watch how that works. It's a great way to learn. What's a grand jury? Um, you need to be able to follow a city hall or state house debate. Do you understand how it works? Do you understand committees and subcommittees? Do you understand conference committees? Do you understand the difference between the Senate and the House? Do you understand what a veto is and what a... Um, uh, how, how they go about overriding vetoes and things like that. It's basic civics, and it's critical that you get this. If, because if you get this wrong while you're reporting, you're going to look really dumb. And you'll be really unemployed. The difference between a warrant, an arrest, an incident report, parole hearings, things like that, those are all just bread and butter, meat and potato stuff that every journalist eventually ends up doing stories on. Um, so I used to love to, write, uh, to, wa to read uh, uh, warrants, search warrants. Man, I found more stories in search warrants, especially when they return the search warrants and file something called a bill of particulars. A bill of particular is a listing of all the stuff that they got when they went and searched something. And that's, you think, wow, that's a great story. I didn't know that they got all that stuff. They got a boat, they got you know, computer drives, they got gazillion dollars in cash, that's a searchable story. I mean, you could do something with that. So don't just do a story that they raided something, wait 48 hours or 72 hours or however long it is in your area, find out what they actually seized when they went and got the search warrant. That's a great story. Basic math and science. I find that this is one of the things, journalists often tell me, you know, I'm a journalist because I'm not good at math. That doesn't work. Uh, you're really going to have to know some things. You don't have to be like a physicist, but you've got to know something about everything. And so one of the things I would say to you is, is you've got to be good with percentages. A lot of, uh, of journalism math is percentages. Uh, a professor of mine used to call it football math. But you've got to know percentages. You've got to know how to figure percentages. The difference between mean, median, and average. The difference between a virus and a bacteria. I can't tell you how many times I hear people talk about flu symptoms, and they talk about things like nausea. Nausea is not a flu symptom. Stuffy nose, stuffy nose isn't a flu symptom. Flu symptoms are, are fever, chills, body aches. What do you know about physics? Particles, atoms, molecules, human physiology, biology. 
You'll cover more health stories, more cattle disease stories, more dying pigs than you ever thought you would ever cover. You'll cover droughts and, and storms and all kinds of atmospheric weirdness. You'll do all of that stuff. You've got to have a basic understanding of how that kind of stuff works. Gravity, sound, mass, all of these things are things that you have to have a basic knowledge of. How does it work? And I would say, when it comes to history and government, how does your legislature work? How does your city, county government work? Have a basic understanding about, about history that shaped America. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf Wars, of course. Get bonus points if you understand World War I. And the civil rights struggle, which I still think is continuing to shape who we are today. But if you got that, you're in pretty good shape when it comes to, you know, history, mostly. Anybody add anything here? Are you comfortable with this? Would you be able to walk out and do this? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Go to the History Channel, you get a whole bunch of this. Um, but pay attention to it. Make yourself, make yourself smarter about these things. Be able to have a conversation about it. This sounds a lot like uh, general education liberal arts requirements that they have to take. Yeah. It does. <laughs> only, <laughs> Listen to this. Ugh. You know, there's something to that. I'm a big believer in liberal arts um, because, uh, in fact, I'm a big believer in liberal arts, not just for journalists, but for practically anybody. Uh, but, and, there are specific skills that are involved in all this as well. I would say, for journalists, there's awareness, knowledge, and skill. There's awareness, knowledge, and skill. And, and you've got to be a quick, quick, quick learner. The greatest journalists I've ever known are people who can learn things really fast. On the way in up here, I was, I was laughing. I got a call from one of my editors one time when something happened in Egypt. And she says, can you write me? I have 1,500 words explaining cop Coptic Christianity. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, and then uh, not long after that, somebody said, can you do something, uh, 1,500 words, 1,200 words on the God particle, molecular science? Sure, I can do that. Um, I got a call this morning saying, can you do an article on um, journalists and violence? Sure. What do you, when do you want it? <laughs> Tomorrow. Okay, I'll write it tonight. Um, so you got to be able to respond. The answer always is, sure, I could do that. Because that's what I want to be known as. When they call me and say, can you do this? Absolutely. No problem. My boss came to me, uh, you're going to do a, um, a, a, a three-day seminar explaining Obamacare. Okay. <laughs> We're doing it in January. Okay, I'm on it. That just means I've got to learn about Obamacare, which I've spent a lot of time doing. So, I was listening to the radio one day, and I heard this. President Obama and Governor Romney agree that the American dream is out of reach for too many people today. They disagree on how to fix the problem. That's the subject we're going to tackle now as part of our summer-long series, American Dreams. On yesterday's All Things Considered, NPR's Scott Horsley reported on how Democrats view the American dream. And now here's NPR's Ari Shapiro to tell us about the Republican perspective. On the campaign trail, Mitt Romney's definition of the American dream sounds pretty universal. If you're willing to take risk and work hard and get education, have the right values, anyone can make a better life. We are the land of opportunity. That's a definition President Obama could get behind. The parties disagree more over how to make sure the American dream survives and what to do when it disappears from places like Elyria, Ohio. Well, it used to be a thriving area. It's not thriving anymore because people aren't working. Tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs have left this part of Ohio. But Pam Malcolm says if the government steps in to help, that'll just make people sit back and stop trying. She works as a cashier, she's active in the Tea Party movement, and she says every day she sees the impact of government assistance. You know, it's like, they have $1,000 a month in food stamps, they have their nails done, they have really nice smartphones, and here I am working my tail end off. I can't buy sushi, I can't buy filet mignon, and I can't buy crab legs, and uh, it's just, it's very irritating. <laughs> what, what now? 
How much are they getting in food stamps? A thousand dollars a month. That's a lot. Could that be right? A thousand dollars. Could you get twelve thousand dollars a year in food stamps in Ohio? Really? $900? Yes. Is that true? Yes. For, for I work for a family who pre prior to this year was getting $930 a month in food stamps. How many children? Four. Four children. Four so children. six people. <clears throat> six people. They had a taxable income of about $2,000 a year. Oh, so they had $2,000 a year. Yes. That they made, that yes. they had an income of $2,000 a year. Yep. And they are six people and they're getting $1,000 a month. Yep. Is that right? Yes. So six people times $1,000 a month, what's that, about um, $140 a month per person? No. Something like that? Is that right? Something like that. A little more net, $170 a month. Um, well, I can tell you this, that when I go to Kaiser Health Facts and I pull up how much people making food stamps, it's not $1,000 a month. It's $139. $139 per person. Not $1,000. $139. Oh, well, that's different. Could you live on $139 a month for food? Let me help you with that. No. Not unless you're like a really good ramen noodle person. <laughs> right? So it's not $1,000, it's $139. And I don't know how many times I've heard, oh yeah, these people, they come in on this food stamps, you know, they're getting a the filet mignon. Probably not. My church runs a food bank, uh, and what I see is desperation. What I see are hungry people who are trying to get it stuck together in a month. My wife runs uh, a program that's that feeds hungry children on the weekends uh, through our schools. And what we see is a growing number of truly needy, hungry people. All I'm asking you to do is when you hear a number like that, go, really? Is that right? Because I bet it's not. And yet it becomes part of our vernacular. And as a journalist, what I want you to get used to is, is to stop and say, where'd that come from? Is that true? It could be true, but it's probably not. Who gets welfare, by the way? A higher percentage of rural recipients as opposed to urban recipients. Families on welfare average 2.5 people. Oh, wait a minute, I thought they had a whole bunch of kids so they could get more welfare dollars. No. Temporary assistance has a 60-month lifetime limit. You can't live on temporary assistance for your lifetime. Contrary to popular thought, you can't. And it pays an average of $215 a month. The majority of welfare recipients are white. Not what I see on TV. And by the way, about 6.4% of welfare recipients are teen moms. One of the great untold stories in the United States is the steep decline in, te in teen pregnancies. For the last 15 years, teen pregnancies have been in a rapid decline. It's a great success story. Almost never gets told. Why? It runs popular uh, thinking right in the ground, right? The popular story is these kids today, all they do is go out and get pregnant. That's what they think you do. <laughs> Surprised we haven't heard a baby out in the audience. <laughs> but if I watch the news, that's exactly what I would think, right? You promiscuous little people, you. Media literacy. Who's Edward R. Murrow? Egypt. <laughs> Who's Edward R. Murrow? He's a radio announcer. Yeah, he was a radio announcer turned into a, a TV. TV announcer for uh, CBS. CBS News. So far, you're rolling. Um, Murrow for 800, please. Um, what senator did he? Um, McCarthy. Yay, McCarthy. Good. <laughs> You read a book? <laughs> Headline, student okay. read book. Yeah, very good. In your class? Yes. Excellent. What, what's Watergate? Oh, 
What's Watergate? What is Watergate? It's an office complex, hotel complex. It was a, partly a hotel, but it was an office complex. What happened at Watergate? If you go there, it's a big white building. You see it, it's kind of curvy in DC. What happened at Watergate? You've heard of Watergate, yes? Yeah, what happened at Watergate? Some burglars broke in, right? To what, do you remember? Yes, it was a Democrat's office, right? Yeah. And who did that? The Republicans. Some Republicans who had connections to the... White House. Hey, now we're rolling. <laughs> What's Times versus Sullivan? Times versus Sullivan. Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. Times versus Sullivan is... Um, it's what we use to determine whether or not somebody can successfully sue you as journalists for libel or defamation. And it, it, it actually didn't come from a news story. It actually came from an advertisement of all things. Um, but uh, what happened is, is that you actually, if you're, if you're a, a public person, like a mayor or a sheriff or a something, um, if you're a public person, in order to successfully sue for defamation and libel, you have to, you have, under Times versus Sullivan, a Supreme Court decision, you have to prove one, uh, you, two things. One, reckless disregard for the truth. Reckless disregard for the truth. And the other is, you meant to harm them. You have to, you have to prove intent. I meant to do it. So not only did I, was I reckless, I meant to harm you. So, um, this is important. If you didn't know this, if I said, tell me about Times versus Sullivan. Tell me about libel and defamation. If you were trying to apply for a job and you didn't know that, I'd say, bye. Honestly, I wouldn't have hired you. I wouldn't have. Because if you don't know defamation, if you don't know libel law, I can't have you. It's too risky for me. And this is pretty basic. Search engine optimization, what's that? I bet you can get this one, right? What's SEO? It's trying to get your content to the top of the... Good. How do you do that? What's two things you can do to do that? Um, well, you can use keywords. Um, keywords. Yeah. Like what? If I was doing something on the Obamacare thing today, what would I make sure and have in the headline? Um, Obama speech... Care. Care, yes. Obama <laughs> care. <laughs> Healthcare, insurance, right? Yeah. So it's how do you, ooh, I just touched something. Um, it's, uh, it's all the key words that the search engines are going to want in order to, um, to find you, right? So if you don't know how to do SEO, you're never going to be successful as a web writer at all. That's all it is. You gotta know what that is. Look, if you don't know, if you don't know new things, and SEO is not even new now. If you don't know about things like search engine optimization, then you're not really a valuable asset to my newsroom because I've already got a newsroom full of people that don't know anything. I mean, you've got to know something new when you come out, right? It's like a new doctor out of medical school. You want them to know the latest things, right? Well, same thing with you. You come out, I want you to know all kinds of stuff about nonlinear editing and DSLR video and all kinds of stuff. I need for you to know all that stuff. You gotta infuse the newsroom with your new knowledge. Fair use in copyright. A basic understanding of what you can use from copyrighted material, especially stuff online. What is, the, what is basic copyright law? Do you, know, do you know what copyright law is? Do you understand copyright? If you don't know that, then I can't trust you not to go stealing stuff from other places and go to get me sued. That's why all this matters. I mean, it seems like you're just taking a law class, but the fact of the matter is it has everything to do with whether or not you're employable. You wouldn't graduate from police academy and not know how to arrest somebody or not know about search warrants and stuff. It's no different. These are skills you've got to know. Current affairs, you got to, can anybody name a state rep or a state senator who represents you in your district right now? Who's the congressperson from this district? 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a problem. You don't know a congressperson from this district? You know one in Michigan? Okay, before I see you tomorrow, you will all know a congressperson who represents this area. Everybody put up your right hand. Put up your right hand. If you're breathing the oxygen in this room, put up your right hand. Repeat after me. Al? Al. I promise by this time tomorrow, I'll know the congressman representing this district. Okay, you promised. Pox on your house if you don't do it. <laughs> Who's the governor of the state? Are you serious? Who's the governor for this state? What party is it? Oh, no. um, who's the mayor for this town? Tell me a story that's accurate, that's focused, that's sourced, that's relevant and new. I'm going to assume you're going to be able to tell stories. And by the way, don't just tell me stuff that somebody else has already told. The way you're going to get a job is if your resume is full of things that's new, that you're the only one new about. Generate. Generate. Don't just copy. Generate. Um, I want them to see the difference between reporting facts and reporting a story. Here's what reporting facts looks like. It's six people per kilometer. World Vision staff told listeners at a meeting that more Ethiopians are getting clean drinking water. They say 60% of Ethiopia's 80 million people still don't have access to clean water, but it used to be worse. 4.5% of the people had access to clean water. Today it has reached about 37.5%. So it is increasing, but we need to still to work hard. They say progress is being made, but it needs to be easier to get clean water because 250,000 children die every year from dirty water and issues of sanitation. Because of lack of clean water, there were waterborne diseases affecting the health of the people, particularly children. World Vision officials say their programs help and need more people's support. All right, that's a fact. Here's a story. Every day, Zena Jigso walks from her village to get water for her family. Two hours each way, two round trips, eight hours every day. Most girls here have done this since they were about seven years old. And as backbreaking as that sounds, it is even more heartbreaking because the water makes their families sick. Zina gets her drinking water here at the Dilla River. 800 people use the river to wash themselves, their clothes, even their baby's diapers. It's a slow-moving stream at best, and it's their only option. Just upriver, livestock use it too. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this picture is a novel in which a child dies on every page from waterborne sicknesses like giardia and diarrhea. Back at her home, Zena told us her only daughter died of diarrhea. So did four of her neighbor's children. And one night, her youngest boy got sick, Zena's husband, Demi say. At four in the morning, he woke up. We saw him stretching his whole body, that tiny baby. The nearest hospital was four hours away, and so they set out walking. Demi Say was holding him when he felt his little boy die. <laughs> and the saddest thing? Zena will return to the same contaminated water tomorrow. What's the difference between the treatment of those two stories? It's exactly the same video. Uh, with a little bit of difference, but mostly it's exactly the same. What's the difference in those two videos? Emotion. Emotion, right. And principally, video stories tell stories through emotion, right? You, you principally learn through emotion when it's video. 
And so it's critical that we understand the difference between telling me a bunch of facts and telling me actually a story. Why? Because I'm always going to remember what I feel longer than what I know. I'm going to remember what I feel longer than what I know. So when you show me a collection of your work and all it is just a bunch of facts, I'm not against facts, but I want you to be able to deliver those facts, deliver those facts through characters, through emotion. Make me care. And I'm going to mostly care if it has to do with my money, family, safety, health, community. This story had a family emotor, it had a, a, a safety emotor, a health emotor, and it probably also had some kind of community emotor if you could actually sort of see that village as a community that you could care about. Nine big multimedia tools. Nine big tools that you've got to be able to use on any story that you're assigned to. The first three are not at all surprising. Video, audio, text, and data. You're already probably pretty good at this. You're good at shooting video, you're good at audio, and you can write stories, yes? Yes? Yeah, There's, at some level you can write, right? And at some level, you're already doing data. You're reporting scores, or you're reporting budget numbers, or you're reporting you know, attendance numbers, or whatever. I, see, I read your newspaper, I see you're doing stories all the time that have data in them. So you're already doing the big three. One question is, is are you doing these across platform? What I noticed about your, your online, um, uh, the, the newspaper, is that it's really very printy. It's not as multimedia as I know you could do if you stretched yourself out that way. Data mapping. Interactive gaming is becoming increasingly important. I've heard about the gamification of news for years and years and years and it really didn't take hold, but now it's starting to as it's becoming less and less difficult to put together interesting interactives using gaming data. Slideshows, user contributed content clearly people sending photographs, videos. I'm not a huge user of chat. I don't like chat much because mostly it's a pooling of ignorance, but what I find with chat is that it's good, it's useful if you use chat when the public actually knows something. Chat is least useful when it's just emotion. It's most useful when the public is actually sharing something. And then of course social media in important ways. Tap social media, but let's remember the end game. Okay, I thought this would play up here. NASCAR. You guys dig NASCAR up here, right? No, no. Huh? No. Pretend you dig NASCAR up here. <laughs> um, okay, so anybody know who this guy is? Dale Earnhardt Jr. See, I knew you'd know him. All right, so Dale Earnhardt Jr. And Dale Earnhardt Jr. Um, was in a crash at Daytona and he got a concussion and with three races left to the end of the season, Dale Earnhardt Jr. had to sit out two races, which meant he wasn't going to win the NASCAR Cup. Big story. This was on ESPN. It was on the front page of ESPN. Title shot wrecked. Dale Earnhardt Jr. wasn't happy after Talladega. Now the news is, I said Daytona, it was Talladega. Uh, now the news is worse, he'll be out for two races with a concussion ending his title hopes. Big story. Happened on a Monday after an NFL football weekend. ESPN ran this on their front page along with, you know, a 150 word, 200 word text story and a photo from the Talladega wreck. Whenever you get to a story, the first thing you need to do is file 150 words and get a photograph. Once you've got 150 words and a photograph, you're rolling. You can do anything with it. You can Facebook it, you can tweet it, you can put it on your website, you can report it on there. You can do all kinds of stuff once you've got 150 words and text. That's the magic. So that's what they did. But I was shocked, shocked I tell you, that six hours later, this story still wasn't on their Twitter page. It still wasn't on ESPN's Twitter page. Why does this matter? Because ESPN has 5.3 million Twitter followers. Oops. 
They did put it, however, on their NASCAR ESPN page. Well, that's good, but the NASCAR ESPN page has a tiny fraction of the number of followers, and it would have only taken a hashtag to get them over to ESPN. Over on the ESPN Facebook page, where they have, by the way, 8 million likes, six hours after the announcement, there still was nothing. Incredible. 8 million followers. Nothing. Look, nothing. They're still doing something from Sunday with somebody getting some Gatorade poured on them. Who cares? But over on Dale's Facebook page, and he, by the way, has one and a half million followers, on Dale Earnhardt's own page, he's aggressively covering his own story. In fact, they're live streaming his news conference. And on Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s website, you can actually have a live interactive chat with his neurologist, asking how he's doing, like you're his brother-in-law or something. <laughs> so here's the lesson. Why do you get involved? Why do you have to be involved in social media if you're going to be a journalist? Because increasingly your competition isn't just the other guy across town. Increasingly it's the source of news themselves that's going straight to the public. I see it all the time with politicians. Every member of the House and Senate now has a Twitter page. I see it with politicians who go straight to the public. I see it with celebrities, straight to the public. So what's happening is, is you're not just competing with your, with your normal media competitors, you're competing with the whole globe now, and, and, and especially with the news source themselves. Really interesting. Really interesting. Obama tweeted his own reaction to being reelected. It was one of the most retweeted tweets in the history of Twitter. And he followed himself. Sources are speaking directly to the public. And if you're social media aware, we'll move to the online conversation back to our legacy media. So this is just critical to your survival, that you be a really, really smart social media user. Why do I tell this to a bunch of college students? Because if you don't know how to do this, you're not going to be employable. If you don't have a really sharp idea about how to use social media, then why would I hire you? Why don't I just hire the old guy? If I'm going to hire someone who's relatively inexperienced, you've got to bring new tools to my newsroom, new awarenesses. Here's what these people think you know. They think you know how to code. They think you know how to do um, HTML5. They think that you, they think you know how to do all that stuff. They think you can Photoshop, you can build something in Flash, you can edit video, you can shoot. They think you know how to do all that. You and I both know, most of you don't know how to do all that, right? But they think you grew up with all that, so surely you must know that. That's what they expect for you. It's unfair, but it's true. So you gotta know it, or you're not gonna be employable. Are you okay? I don't wanna make you sad. <laughs> Hey, five minutes. five minutes. Look at this. Even senators are doing their own um, YouTubes to try to get people to care about their issues. Has this ever happened to you? You try to put a dollar bill in and it's wrinkled, it won't take it. Well, that's why I've introduced bipartisan legislation to replace the dollar bill with a dollar coin. Think of it this way. Over a 30-year lifespan, you'll go through 17 of these and only one of these. That means environmentally it's more friendly. You don't have to cut down as many trees. And the dollar coin is 100% recyclable when it runs out, not so with the dollar bill. This would save taxpayers in this country over $200 million every year if we go to the dollar coin. Well, if you want any more information on this legislation and on the benefits of a dollar coin, please visit my website at harkin.senate.gov. And it works. Tom Harkin actually goes straight to the public with his own message, with a YouTube video. Brilliant. 
What do you notice about this picture? You remember this picture? This was during the uh, Occupy sit-in. What do you notice about this picture? Isn't that amazing? There's only, there's only two professional photographers in the entire photograph, 17 amateurs. And by the way, the lady in the middle there who has the professional audio equipment <laughs> is so shocked she forgot to record. <laughs> um, but um, the fact of the matter is, is that there's only, uh, you, you see iPhones, you see iPads, you see, there's only two professional photographers in the whole group. This is increasingly how we're documenting life is through phones and mobile devices. That's both good news and bad news. I'm, I'm not here to judge one or the other. I think it's, I think it's some of both. I'm going to pass by that. To show you this, increasingly, multimedia means data mapping. Um, does this look like anything you've ever seen before, this little, this graphic? I bet it does. I bet it does. Guitar Hero, I heard somebody say it. Yeah, this is Guitar Hero. This is the Guardian using the Guitar Hero interface to map the Arab Spring. So what you do is you go up the map and you can see what was going on in Bahrain or Egypt at the same time that it was going on in Libya, at the same time it was going on in Yemen. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so using the Guitar Hero interface, this is like gamification of news, right? That's what I'm talking about. Using familiar interfaces that make data accessible to groups that normally wouldn't consider them. And by the way, it's really, really good journalism. It's the, uh, if you're interested in multimedia, I recommend you go to the Guardian website. Uh, it's a British news site, but it's uh, very, very reputable, really good. If you really wanted to know, for example, whether you overpaid for your bag of pot, you would go to <laughs> priceofweed.com, which would, it takes in Minute by minute by minute, people say how much they paid for their bag of weed, and it maps user-contributed content. While, while on the surface this seems goofy, let me just tell you what's going on right now. What's one of the big, big growth industries? Medicinal marijuana. And this is not going to be silliness as medicinal marijuana becomes serious pharmaceutical. In March, in March, the government of Canada takes over marijuana grow in the whole country. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, is going to open up, is currently constructing, is going to open up warehouse-sized marijuana farms. And the government will control it and sell. The government will actually be in the business of selling the marijuana to the millions of Canadian pot smokers who will use it for medicinal marijuana. This is not small, this is huge. Um, oh, I'm, raw video. Um, one of the things about raw video is that it can be just a, an online gold. Um, this is a friend of mine named Brian Moss who's an investigative reporter in Denver, and he got a tip that in order to work as a de-icer at the Denver International Airport, you have to get a permit. You have to take a test and get a permit. And he got a tip that if you go take the test, when you're taking the test, they'll actually give you the answers. That doesn't seem possible. So they sent four different people undercover with cameras to take the test, and all four times. Evidence B Bravo 8A 9C 10C. Are you kidding me? I can pass that test. In all four cases, they took the test and they read the answers to them. But Christopher incredible. So Brian Moss was smart enough to know that it's not just about investigating, it's also about capturing the video and making that video accessible to the public. We're going to pause right here. What have you learned so far today? 
What does it take in order to become a journalist? Whether it's stuff you learned in fourth grade or stuff you... You've got to be curious about everything. You've got to be curious about everything. If you're not a person who's naturally curious, we found at least two stories on the way up here. On the way up here from Indianapolis, I looked over, there was all these barriers, these sound barriers on the side of the interstate. And there's doors cut into them that says fire hydrant access. I don't know how many we passed. There must have been 30, 40, 50 of them. I said, why do they have a door to a fire hydrant on the interstate? I don't understand. Why would they do that? Why would they cut a door into a block wall and put fire hydrants next to the interstate? I don't understand. There's no fire hydrants when there's not a block wall. Why is there a fire hydrant next to the, I still don't know. But I sure would want to find out. And those windmills, they're just amazing to me. They're just amazing. I would want to do like 100,000 stories on those windmills. I just think they're just, how many birds do those things kill? <laughs> I bet they, I bet you, I bet there, it's a carcass farm underneath those things. I'll bet it is. And so I would go with the ornithology people to go down there because I'll bet you they go down there and look at bird bodies all the time. I'll bet you they do. And I'll bet you the bird rehab people are constantly gathering hawks and owls and stuff out of there. I'll bet you. I'll bet you they are. I get excited about just thinking about it. <laughs> if you can't get excited about stuff like that, probably isn't for you. It's probably not for you. But let me just tell you something. If you dig that kind of stuff, if you dig learning stuff, if you don't care that you don't know what you're going to do today, but you'll figure it out when you get to work, man, there is no better way to make a living. And there are very, very, very few jobs that you can make as big an impact as you can if you're a journalist. You can, I mean, I've seen your poster at the airport. You can change the world. As a journalist, you can change the world. You can. You can. You can, you can find wrongdoing and hold people accountable in ways that you couldn't do in any other profession. You can find opportunities. You can, you can, you can find factories poisoning water. You can celebrate good things that somebody does, give voice to the voiceless, hold the powerful accountable. You can do all those things in ways that you would never be able to do in another profession. It is, it is a great way to, to spend your life, a very honorable way to spend your life. But if this isn't the kind of thing you like, you're not gonna like this kind of thing. <laughs> so I hope that I'm gonna get to spend time with all of you um, over the next day and a half. Um, but uh, and if not, I guess I'll see you in chapel tomorrow. And we'll pray for your future tomorrow. Um, and pray for your parents, too. Um, so I'll see you, um, I hope, in the next uh, day or two. And thanks for uh, being fun. <laughs>